Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? I got to compose myself after that last song. Oh my goodness. If you can't get excited about that, you ain't woken up yet today, okay? Man, how's everybody feeling? You okay? All right, everybody made it through Dorian all right. If you didn't, it, it barely rained at my house, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? But if, it, if you have some stuff that you need to get cleaned up and you need some help, seriously, we want to help you because we really are in this together. We don't just say that. We want to come and we want to help you out. So email us at hello at swisscovechristian.com and just let us know what you need and we'll be over there to help you out, okay? Um, several of you have asked me this morning, how can, we, how can we help the people in the Bahamas? What can we do? Okay, there is a fantastic organization, it's IDES, that's I-D-E-S, it stands for International Disaster Emergency Services that we work with here at the Cove, and they are doing some amazing things. If you want to donate, if you want to help out, then go to IDES.com, you can donate right from there, okay? And we want to be in this together, not just with each other at the Cove, but with the kingdom as a whole. And so we're going to help out the people of the Bahamas in that way as well. So if you want to get some help, head over to Ides and check them out, okay? There are moments in our lives where we realize that things are out of our control, right? Like hurricanes and other events. And one of those moments for me was when I found out that I was going to be a dad for the very first time, you know? I, I was terrified. I'm going to be real with you, okay? I was terrified. And it, here's why. I am the oldest of three kids, okay? I have two first cousins, And before Micah was born, there had not been a child born into my family in 20 years. Okay, so you might say that my experience with little, little kids was, you know, lacking, I guess you could say that. I mean, I've been in church for a while, you know, I've been in ministry for a little bit. So, you know, it's not like I hadn't ever seen a child before, but how many of you know there's a difference between teaching a child about Jesus for a couple hours and sending them home and taking one home to live with you? There's a big difference, okay? And I was freaking out. And I'm not sure if I can point to an exact moment when the terror gripped me, but I can tell you when it came, it did. And I said, all right, I need some help. And Abby mentioned in her 30-day challenge devotion, which by the way, if you haven't been listening to those, they are incredible. You guys did a phenomenal job. If you still need copies of the 30-day challenge, you can pick them up at the doors on your way out today, or you can get all of them on our website right from the homepage. They're phenomenal. But Abby was talking about in hers how we come from ministry families. Okay, both sides of our family are in ministry. And so since we're in ministry, we don't live anywhere close to them. And so there's no just like running over to mom and dad's house to ask them, what do I do? That's not a thing. And so we rely on our church family to be our family. And at the time when we were getting ready to have Micah, we were living in Clearwater. And there was this guy at the church and I knew him okay, but I didn't know him very well. What I did know about him was that he'd been married for a long time and he had a phenomenal marriage. He had two grown children, but both were out of the house in college, and they loved Jesus, and they loved their family. And so I said to myself, self, if this is where you are in 20 years, you're going to do okay. And so I did something that's really outside of my comfort zone as an introvert. I went and I asked him, I said, can I just talk with you? Because I need to know how you did what you did. Because I don't know a lot of things, but I do know that a family like this doesn't happen on accident. There are some things that you did along the way, and I just want to ask you how you did it. And he graciously accepted, and we talk still to this day. He listens to my crazy questions and answers me patiently. He opened up his family and his life to me and to my family. And I'm here to tell you that I'm a better man, I'm a better husband, I'm a better father. I'm a better leader. I'm a better follower of Jesus because Bill Lamell is in my life. And there's nothing that I or my family wouldn't do for Bill and Teresa and their family. And we want these kind of relationships in our lives, don't we? We want the people who call us because they know something's going on, even if we haven't told them. We want the kind of people who can look us in the eye and say, you can do better than that because I know you and I love you and we're gonna get through it together. We want these kind of relationships, don't we? But most of us don't have them, or if we do, we have very few of them. And it's because especially as an adult, we want intimacy without vulnerability. 
And unfortunately, that's not possible. We don't get intimacy without vulnerability. And we know that if we're gonna, if we're gonna have these kind of relationships, we're gonna have to tell people some things that we don't normally tell people. We're gonna have to let people see things that we normally try to hide. We're gonna have to give them unfiltered access to our lives. We're gonna have to be vulnerable with them before we can be intimate. And we do this with people and we do this with God too, don't we? Most of us in our prayer lives, if we have one, we'll say things like, God, forgive me when I mess up and you know, bless my family. Thank you for loving me in Jesus' name. And we go on. But we don't pray things like, God, I am struggling with lust right now. Give me eyes only for my wife because I don't want to be this person. Just get rid of that nonsense in my life. Help me to be the man that you've called me to be. God, help us get out of credit card debt because it's crushing our family. And we want to leave a legacy of generosity for our kids and our grandkids. We don't pray like that. We pray, you know, just help us do better today. Forgive me when I mess up. And it's funny because, you know, we keep God at arm's length and then wonder why he feels distant. But we don't get intimacy without vulnerability, whether it's with people or whether it's with God. And, and maybe, maybe you're here this morning or you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast later and you're going, yeah, I want that. I, just, I don't really know where to start. Like, how do I get going in this? And I just wonder, as is usually the case, if we're not making this more complicated than it actually is. You know, when Jesus was 12 years old, his parents took him to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, and something interesting happened. And I want to just read it to you. This passage is from Luke chapter 2, and here's how Luke describes the scene. It says, every year... Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. And after the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Watch this. His parents didn't miss him as first. You know, that's how they were real parents, right? Because they didn't miss him at all. They're like, ooh, it's a little bit quiet around here. This is nice. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. Now, I'm not going to ask you to show your hands, but if you've ever lost a child, you know the panic that grips you in that moment. I just want you to take that and multiply it by about 10 billion times. Okay, this is the son of God, okay? An angel showed up to announce his birth. What do you think's going to happen when God realizes they don't know where this boy is? Yeah, they're going, oh my goodness, I've got to fix this now. So they did what smart people do when they lose things. They went back to the beginning, right? It says when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days. Oh my goodness. If you've lost the child for 30 seconds, it feels like an eternity. Imagine three days later, they finally found him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them. And asking questions, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? They didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And I want you to see this. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. And some translations say in favor with God and with man. Now, regardless of whatever, what you think of Mary and Joseph's parenting style here, I want you to notice this last sentence. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. And this is where many of us miss the boat, right? Because we kind of focus on one or the other. We want to gain favor, but we want to gain favor either with God or with man and not with God and with man because it's kind of hard to balance that out. But you know, the problem is that when we seek only God's favor, we become Pharisees yelling at lost people for their sinfulness. When we seek only God's favor, we become Pharisees yelling at lost people for their sinfulness and we all know this person. I'm going to assume for just a second that you're not this person, but you know this person, don't you? They're the person that you go to when you have a Bible question 
because you know that they're going to have the right answer because their theology is on point, but you try not to hang out with them too much because they always make you feel bad about yourself, just like they make everybody else feel bad, and nobody really wants to hang out with them because they, they might be correct, but they're mean, and people don't want to be around them. And maybe you are, maybe you are this person, and I just want to talk to you for a second. If this is you, God still loves you. Jesus still has a plan for you. He wants you to make a difference in people's lives. But I need you to remember that Jesus reserved his harshest criticism, his harshest words for those people who knew everything there was to know about God, but drove people away from him with their attitudes and actions. You need to sprinkle in a little love with that truth you're throwing down all the time. Some of us went the other way though, didn't we? Because maybe we grew up in a church and this was our preacher always yelling at us, telling us how terrible we were and how awful we are. And maybe you got it at church. Maybe you got it at home. Maybe you got it at both places. I don't know. But for whatever reason, you decided that you were never going to be that person. You made a promise to yourself. I'm not going to be that person. I'm just going to make everybody feel good. We're going to get along. Everything's going to be okay. And you kind of went the other way where, you know, some people seek just the favor of God. You kind of went the other way. You said, I'm going to seek the favor of man. The problem is when we only seek the favor of man, we brush aside things that we shouldn't and we don't end up helping anybody. When we only seek the favor of men, we brush aside things we shouldn't and don't end up helping anybody. Listen, you're not doing anybody a favor by pretending everything's okay when you know that it's not. That's not what friends do. That's not what people who want to be there for each other, that's not what they do. If you went to the doctor and they said, we found a mass, don't worry, everything's cool, it'll go away on its own. You'd feel pretty good for a little bit, at least until you found out that it was actually cancer and they knew the whole time and you'd be so angry, wouldn't you? And it sounds ridiculous when I say it that way, but we do that to each other all the time, don't we? Because if I know you, I can see when you're heading down a path that you shouldn't be on and I can see that it's gonna hurt you, but I don't say anything because I don't wanna hurt your feelings. Listen, we're not helping anybody when we spare their feelings at the expense of their soul. That's not what Jesus wants from us either, is it? He wants us to speak the truth in love, and in order to do that, we've gotta grow in favor with God and with man. And when we do these two things together, we can make a difference in people's lives. You know, I said a little bit ago, that I'm a different person because Bill Lamell is in my life. And you need to be that person for somebody too. We need, as much as we need those people in our lives, God's calling us to be difference makers in the lives of other people. And how do we do that? I'm gonna make it real simple. Just two things I want you to remember. Difference makers show up and stay. Difference makers show up and they stay. And showing up is a lot different than speaking up, you know, because speaking up is easy. And we do that all the time. It doesn't really cost us anything. We just run our mouth or maybe in this day and age, we run our fingers across the keyboard and just throw it out into space on social or whatever. And you're looking at me funny, but I know, listen, I follow you on Facebook. I know what you're talking about, okay? We, have a, we don't have any problem speaking up. But listen, until you show up in somebody's life, you don't have any right to speak up about it. And the fact of the matter is, they don't care what you have to say about their life if you're not willing to take the time to show up and be a part of it. And I just want to ask you this morning, what would change in our lives and the lives of those around us and the lives of those close to us in our city, in our world, if we spent the same amount of time and effort and energy that we do speaking up about things, what if we spent that same amount of time showing up in the lives of people around us, showing up when they're in the hospital, showing up when they lost a child, showing up when their marriage is struggling, showing up when they're addicted surfaces again, whether it's alcohol or drugs or pornography, whatever it is, showing up when they're thinking about moving, helping them pack the van to leave and calling them anyway and making sure that everything's okay. What would change? You know what would change? We would go from speaking up to speaking into somebody's life. And you know, there's a big difference between speaking up about somebody and being able to speak into their life. Because when you're able to speak into somebody's life, you can actually affect some change in that person. You can be a difference maker in their life. You, after a while, when you start showing up, 
You earn the right to say things to them that other people just can't say. Why? Because you took the time to show up and be a part of their life. And you know, when you do that, people start asking you questions. And I just want to ask you one this morning as well. Do you feel prepared to answer the questions that your lost friends are asking? Notice I phrased this very intentionally. Do you feel prepared to answer the questions your lost friends are asking? Because as Christians, a lot of times we're prepared to answer all kinds of questions that ain't nobody asking, okay? There is nobody walking around Walmart right now. It's Sunday morning, Christians are at church. There's nobody walking around Walmart right now wondering, you know, what was the name of the first king of Israel? What was his name? I just wish somebody was here to answer that for me. I wonder which view of the millennium in Revelation, which one's right? Is it pre, post, all? Like, what is it? Nobody's wondering that. And I'm not saying that theology doesn't matter. I'm just saying these aren't the questions that people are wondering as they walk around without Jesus in their life. If you start to show up in people's lives, they're going to ask you questions. But they're going to ask you questions that look more like this. Why do you have hope? What's different between you and me? What's the purpose of life? Because listen, sometimes I feel like we're just spinning around on a rock around the sun waiting on it to go out. Is there there more to it than this? Why is life so hard sometimes? And you believe in God, right? So tell me, since you believe in God, where was he when I was hurting? You ready to answer Those questions, I hope you are. And if you're not, we can help you get ready to answer those questions. But let me tell you, you're not going to have the opportunity to answer those questions if you don't show up in people's lives because they will never trust you enough to ask them. Difference makers show up and difference makers stay. They show up and they stay because it's not enough just to show up, is it? You got to stay. And we come in and out of people's lives so quickly, don't we? Did you know this is an old stat, but I just want to throw it out at you because I think it's pretty accurate. It might even be shorter now based on the people that I graduated Bible college with. Did you know that the average tenure of a youth minister in the United States is 18 months? 18 months. And we wonder why we have a hard time connecting with each other because we don't stay in each other's lives long enough to make an impact anyway. We want, we want intimacy, but we want that 30-day six-pack, right? We want the miracle pill that's going to let me lose 60 pounds in 60 days and change my life forever. And we know that's not how life works. We know it's not how it works physically. We know it's not how it works relationally. We know it's not how it works spiritually either. But that's what we want. We don't stay in each other's lives long enough to make a difference. But church, if we're going to be difference makers, we're going to show up and we're going to stay. And when you stay in somebody's life, it's going to get messy, isn't it? There are going to be days when you wish you didn't show up because it's going to get hard. But let me tell you something. You're not going to quit. You're going to stay in the middle of the mess because you know that it's the mess that binds us together, isn't it? It's the mess that makes the good times even more beautiful. So church, we're going to show up and we're going to stay. We're going to show up. We're going to stay at church. You know, some of us have been here for a long time. You've been coming for a long time, and that's good. That's, that's a good first step of faith, isn't it? Just to show up and be here. But some of y'all have been coming for a long time, and you say, I just don't, I just don't feel connected. I'm going to come up in your grill for a minute and ask you some questions, okay? You don't feel connected. Well, it's because you're not connected. It's because you come late after the music's already started, so you ain't got to talk to nobody. And then you leave in the middle of the last song because if you wait until the end, then you're going to have to walk out with everybody else and they're going to ask you questions. You're going to be late to lunch. It's just going to mess everything up. So you come late, you leave early, you don't serve anywhere, you're not in a group, and you say, I don't feel connected. It's because you're not connected, okay? That's why. If you want to be a difference maker, you need to know the people who are sitting around, not just their names, okay? You need to know what's going on in their lives. Church, we're going to show up and we're going to stay so we can really actually be in this together because we are. 
We're going to show up. We're going to stay at church. We're going to show up. We're going to stay in the word. And I'm not talking about pulling out your Bible app and checking out the verse of the day so you can keep your streak alive. I'm talking about spending time in the word of God and letting it shape you, letting it change who you are from the inside out. You know, it's really hard to grow in favor with a God you don't know. It's really hard. And if you want to get to know God, you got to let him speak to you. And he does that through his word. So we're going to show up. We're going to stay at church. We're going to show up. We're going to stay in the world. We're going to show up. We're going to stay in our community. You know, last week we said there are 892,000 people in our city. Many of them lost and dying and going to hell. And they need the church to show up. And to stay in their lives, not to just go home, close the garage door, and come back out and talk about Jesus again next week. Listen, Jesus didn't give his life for you so that you could be baptized and not tell anybody about it. He came and he said, listen, I want you to bring the family back together. I want you to go into the world and tell people what I've done and baptize them. I need you to eat with sinners like I did. I need you to write some names on the bottom of your table. I need you to make a difference in their lives. And in order to do that, you're going to have to show up and you're going to have to stay. Whether you're here this morning and you're like, man, I want to be, I want to be with this Jesus guy because, I mean, he made a difference. Before Jesus, there was no way for us to come to God. We were in big trouble. And so Jesus showed up and he gave his life for you and for me. And now, when we become a Christian, what happens? God comes and lives inside us. He showed up and he stayed. And made all the difference in the world, amen? Whether that's you or whether you're here this morning and you say, man, I've been missing it. It's time for me to step up. I'm ready to make a difference, to be a difference maker in the lives of those around me. This is your time. This is your moment. We're going to stand together now. I'm going to pray for you. In church, I'm going to ask you to do two things this week. I hope you can remember them. Show up and stay. Let's pray.